start reading today in uh, Romans chapter 3 and um, with verse 10. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Sure, that's fine. She, she's welcome to do it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, basically this, the subject is uh, that God treats everybody alike, that he uh, doesn't have any favorites, that he doesn't pick and choose certain people to, uh, to bless or to not. That's okay. She's okay. <laughs> it's not going to hurt anything. It's all right. She might. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know. She's exploring. That's okay. Um, so uh, there's a lot of language in the New Testament that lets us know uh, that what God does, he does for everyone. Uh, he makes available for everyone. And uh, this language, uh, and I'm going to point it out to you, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. It is uh, universal language uh, that, it, that tells us explicitly that God's blessings and salvation are universal. Um, universally available to everyone. Uh, nobody's excluded. God's blessings are universal, available to everyone. No one's excluded. And this is all uh, good news because if that's the case, and it is, that includes you and me. Uh, first thing I want to look at, though, is on kind of the negative side, and that is to say that the need for God's uh, blessings, the need for God's salvation is also universal because uh, sin and error uh, and uh, falling short, uh, human frailty is universal. Now, sometimes we think in our minds, we imagine that uh, there are some people who are like super saints, you know, and super spiritual. And, uh, and maybe from our point of view, you know, from a relative point of view, that might seem to be the case. But from God's point of view, it's not the case. Uh, in Romans chapter 3, in verse 10, we find uh, this verse, which is pretty explicit. And this is uh, Paul the Apostle writing, and he, he brings this up, this very idea. He says, uh, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That means that uh, nobody measures up. Nobody meets God's standards. No human being uh, lives up to what is required from a human point of view. That means nobody's good enough. Nobody measures up. Uh, everyone falls short. That's what that means. And just in case a person was, uh, wanted to be argumentative, and some people are, I'm sorry to say, uh, and if a person was going to say, well, that's just Paul's opinion, you notice that he starts by saying it is written as it is written. Um, he's quoting from the 14th Psalm in which these words are found. And David says exactly the same thing. David being a prophet, speaking for God. So this is God's opinion, not Paul's opinion. There is none righteous, no, not one. That is to say, nobody measures up. So, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a strange kind of a way, that's kind of comforting because if you're thinking, well, somebody else has is, is really got this thing down, they're really doing what they're supposed to do, and it's just me that's making mistakes, or has made mistakes. That's not true. Everybody falls short. Nobody is, is good enough from God's point of view. Uh, Paul goes on and even elaborates on this and makes it more plain. Um, if you go down to verse 19, Torin, I'm going to skip down in the same chapter, chapter 3 and verse 19. He says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, listen to this, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Uh, he, he, Paul is saying here that God gave the law to make it explicit and uh, make it plain that everyone is, is guilty before God. Nobody measures up. It's universal, in other words. You see where it says all the world. Uh, those, are, those are words that imply a universality. It implies everyone is included. There's no exceptions. Everyone is guilty uh, apart from Christ, apart from a Savior. 
before God. If you go on down, skip. I'm just kind of skipping here to get this universal language. Uh, verse 23, he says it again. Uh, For all uh, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All is a word that means everybody. It's a universal word. Uh, now, without going any further, and we could go further, but without going any further, you get the point. Um, Paul, and it's not just Paul again, he's quoting from uh, the Old Testament scriptures as well. Uh, everyone falls short. Everyone is in need of uh, a salvation. And uh, everyone is guilty. Everyone stands before God as unrighteous. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone is needy. Nobody measures up. That's the point. So if that's the case, uh, and it is, that's why salvation is also, if everyone, if guilt is universal, salvation then is also universal. And I want you to notice uh, the language that says, that uses the exact same words, uh, but talks about God's salvation or rescue from this condition, from this condition of guiltiness. Um, look at, uh, first of all, Torrin, I'm going to read from uh, Paul's letter to Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. And that's such a small one, I've got to flip several pages here to find it. Um, okay, it's right after 2 Timothy. And Paul's writing to a young man named Titus. And I just want you to notice what the language of the, the verse says here. Just like we read before, all and... Uh, all the world, universal language. Notice what it says here, uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Now I'm reading from the King James translation. I'm going to read some other ones in a moment. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, I like the King James translation, basically. But you have to recognize, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, because there are some people who feel like not only is you know, God's message inspired, but the King James translation is likewise inspired and infallible. That's not true. Uh, translations are made by human beings. King James translation was made by men, scholars, granted. But uh, there are some, you know, any, any translation also uh, carries with it interpretation. And uh, I'm just going to give these men the benefit of the doubt and say that they just, uh, this, they just didn't get the wording right. But I will, I will say this to you. When the King James translation was made in 1611, the king at the time, now get ready for a surprise, was a man named James. <laughs> That's why it's called King James. Um, king James uh, was king of England, and, um, and he was the king that uh, his big project, he wanted to unite uh, England and Scotland and Wales and uh, Ireland. He wanted it all to be one united kingdom. And he even redesigned the flag uh, to reflect this. But originally, before he became king, he was uh, the ruler in Scotland. And Scotland uh, was heavily dominated by a religious idea called Calvinism. And King James shared that point of view. Now, Calvinism is an idea <laughs> that suggests that, contrary to what I'm telling you this morning, that God does pick and choose. Calvinism is an idea that says God predetermines ahead of time who is saved and who is lost. Uh, I say that's not true, and, I, and I'm pointing out scriptures that would kind of contradict that. So here's what I'm saying. The, when King James appointed the men to create this translation, they were very careful not to translate anything that would offend the king. That's why we have the word baptize in the New Testament. Baptize is not an English word. Baptize is a Greek word that is just taken out of the Greek language and put on the page in an English Bible. If they would have translated the word, the Greek word baptizo, uh, they would have had to put in a word that would have offended King James because the Anglican church and the church in Scotland practiced uh, sprinkling for baptism. The word baptizo in the Greek language means to immerse. It means to take something and put it under the water. That's literally what the word means. And so if they would have translated it, uh, 
the king would have been offended because that was not the practice of the church. So the translators chose not to translate it. <laughs> the translators didn't translate it. So they just put it in there, let everybody figure out for themselves what it means. That way they didn't offend the king. Now, the reason I'm saying this to you is this verse seems to imply, by the way it's worded, if you just take it grammatically for what it's saying, what it's saying is the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It makes it sound like you could say, well, the grace of God brings salvation. And you could, if you wanted to be like King James and say, to those that God chooses, you could think of it that way and just say that it, it appear, it's appeared to all men. That's really not what this verse says. And all modern translations say it uh, another way. Let me read it to you how it's translated in the Revised Standard Verse. See if you can see what the difference is. Listen. The grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all men. Now, can you see that's a little different wording? The grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all men. That's how the, a more proper translation should be. God's grace is for the salvation of all men. Not excluding women, it just means mankind. All people is what it means. Uh, and they have worded it this way to avoid that, that awkward uh, sentence structure. And uh, I don't have the Revised Standard Version on the computer, so I couldn't show it to you, but I'm reading it to you. Uh, and I've, as I've said, most other translations say that the grace of God that brings salvation to all men has appeared. It is for all men, all people, in other words. But I do have the uh, Amplified Translation, so Torin's going to give us the Amplified Translation. Of course, there's going to be a lot more words, but that's okay. Listen to this. For the grace of God, His unmerited favor and blessing has come forward, appeared, for the deliverance from sin and the eternal salvation for all mankind. Now, can you see that that wording is universal? It's for all mankind. It's for everybody. Now, the good news about that is that means you too. Uh, the reason I point this out, uh, the reason I bring this up, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a person who likes to go around talking about the devil all the time. And, uh, you know, I, but you have to bring it up sometimes because the New Testament talks about the devil. Now, I'm not an expert. I don't know anything about you know, such matters. I don't want to be an expert, uh, and you know, I don't like to talk about things that are weird or strange or anything of the kind. But I do know that the New Testament, Jesus included, talks about somebody called the devil. And what the New Testament tells us about this personage, and again, I don't claim to know all about it, don't need to know all about it, but here's what I do know. The New Testament describes him as, listen to this, the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. That means what he does is he goes around and accuses uh, the brethren. That's you and me, the Christians. Uh, he's called that in Revelation chapter 12. He's called the accuser of the brethren. You can tell in the ministry of Jesus, if you read the Gospels, the very first thing we read about Jesus in Matthew's Gospel is that uh, he was uh, led into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days and then he was tempted by the devil. And do you know what the devil did? He's a rascal, you know, he doesn't play fair. He came to Jesus and uh, he brought him the Bible. He says, uh, he, he said, uh, if, you're, if you are really, he, he's tried to engender doubt first of all. He tried to get him to doubt. He said, if you're the son of God, Cast yourself down from the high place in the temple because it is written, he said, he will give his angels charge concerning you. Now, see, that's kind of dirty to use the Bible to engender doubt. But you know what I gather from that? If the devil is not embarrassed about using the Bible to engender doubt in the mind of Jesus, then what makes us think that he wouldn't do the same thing with us? And we're not even as equipped as Jesus is, because Jesus knew the Bible pretty well. But I, let me tell you something. The, you, this might surprise you. The devil knows the contents of the Bible. He knows what's there. He knows what's in there. And he will read along with you when you're reading the Bible and try to suggest interpretations to your mind that make you feel 
bad, <laughs> that make you feel condemned, because he is the accuser of the brethren. Now, I don't know how that works. I don't think actually, really, I really don't think that the personal devil himself is present, you know, with all of us. But, but there are demons and there are, you know, spirits and things. And, and I don't think we need to know. I don't think we need to understand it all. But here's what I do know. Thoughts will come to your mind that, that accuse you, that condemn you, that uh, suggest uh, that, you, that you're not what you should be. And anytime you read the Bible, it'll suggest something uh, something fearful or make you feel anxious about it. Those kind of thoughts don't come from God. They don't come. God never brings anything to us that makes us feel anxious or afraid or unsettled or ill at ease. So the reason I'm uh, taking uh, great uh, pains to point out to you verses like this that are universal. See, this is the antidote, the antidote for those kind of thoughts. You just need to have some ideas or scriptures in your mind that let you know that, that those thoughts of uh, fear and um, uh, doubt are incorrect. Like one like this. It says, the grace of God, His unmerited favor and blessing. You know what that tells me right away is that God has an attitude of favor towards you and me. Now see, if I just read that much, God's favor, His unmerited blessing. A thought might come into my mind saying, well, that means somebody else. But go on reading. It has come forward and appeared for the deliverance from sin and the eternal salvation for all mankind. Now when I read that, that tells me that I'm included. If I'm part of all mankind, that's all inclusive. That includes you. In other words, His grace and His favor includes you and me. Even if we're not perfect, even if we don't measure up. You know, that's why I read you those earlier verses. Nobody measures up. Nobody's perfect. You know, if a thought comes to my mind saying, well, uh, you, you fall short. You don't measure up. My answer is, well, big deal. Everybody does. Everybody's excluded. If only, if only perfect people are going to be in heaven, then there's nobody in heaven <laughs> except Jesus. It's a lonely place. There's just Jesus there. <laughs> Everybody falls short. Everybody, didn't we read those a while ago? There's none righteous, no, not one. But in the face of that, God brings us His, that's why it's called unmerited favor. That means we don't deserve it. And it brings salvation for all men. I think the message translation is also very good. Torn, could you give me that? God's readiness to give and forgive is now public. Salvation is available for everyone. Now, does that sound like uh, universal to you? Yeah, that does. Uh, universally available to everyone. Uh, here's another one. Torin, now I'm going to go back to uh, King James. And uh, this, is one, this is Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And this is one we read at Christmas time, but I don't think it hurts to read it again. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Because I want to attract your attention to the words that tell us that it's universal. This is when the angels are talking, or the angel of the Lord is talking to the shepherds, and he says, uh, verse 10, Luke chapter 2, verse 10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not. Again, as we said uh, just before Christmas, uh, the message is don't be afraid. That's the message from heaven. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to just a special few. No, to all people, <laughs> just the lucky ones. No, all people. Well, just the top 10%. No, all people. Well, just those super righteous and holy people. No, there aren't any like that. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This good news of the gospel is for all people. It's for everybody. And you know what that means? That includes me. That includes you. Are you part of all people? Well, yeah, you are. God brings good news and help and His favor and His blessings and His salvation. It's for all people. That includes every one of us. Nobody is excluded. Here's another one. Um, Romans chapter 5, verse 18. And I'm just, really here, I'm just hitting the high spots. We could go on and talk about this 
all day long. I just want to get the main one, the, the, uh, the clear ones, the, the ones that are really easy to, easy to see. Uh, Paul is uh, at this time comparing Adam with Jesus. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 18, I just want you to know the uni notice the universal language he uses. Verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, that is Adam, judgment came upon all men. Do you see? And again, he means mankind, all people. Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Now before we go on reading, let me just analyze what he said. He said, God's judgment and His condemnation came on everyone, not because of the individual mistakes and sins of those individual people, but the root cause of it, he says, is Adam in the beginning. Adam who disobeyed God, Adam who sinned, and you notice, Adam, if you read the story in the sequence, Adam and Eve didn't have any children yet. They didn't have any offspring. After they sinned, and became separated from God and became alienated from God spiritually, that's when all the children were born afterwards. So what I'm saying is he passed on his nature to everyone that came after him, including you and I. And that's what Paul is saying here. By the offense of one, it's Adam's fault. <laughs> Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That's what I was saying earlier when I said that sin and falling short is universal. But likewise, in the same way, what Jesus does is also universal for everyone. Even so, that means in the same way, by the righteousness of one, meaning Jesus, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. You see, the the righteous standard that God requires was fulfilled not by you, but by Jesus. It wasn't your sin that alienated you from God. It was Adam's sin. And it's not your righteousness that makes you right with God. It's Jesus's. Only th well, we'll talk about our part in just a moment. But right now, I just want you to see that God intends for His blessing in this, what He calls here the justification of life, uh, the free gift, He says, it's for everybody. You notice that? Uh, the free gift came upon all men. And the language here makes it plain that it's not because of anybody that earned it or merits it or deserves it. It's not conditional upon performance. It's a free gift. And it's for everybody. Now this is a really good chapter and there's a lot more we could read. But as I said, I'm just trying to get the high points just to make the point. Notice that it's for everybody. This is 2 Corinthians now. Here's another one, 2 Corinthians, I guess Torrin has the two Roman numerals, I, uh, but you can find that, I think. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, uh, oh, I think 19 is what I want. I really like this. Uh, let's see, verse 19. This is a good one, I like this. To wit, now that's not something I say walking down the street every day. Uh, Let's back up and get the earlier verse so we know what he means by to wit. Um, verse, eight, verse 18, Torn. And all things are of God. Meaning, uh, well, we've got to back up and get the previous verse <laughs> so we know what all, all things he's talking about. He doesn't mean everything. The, okay, listen to it. Therefore, if any man, meaning any person, again, notice that it's universal. Anybody. Did you notice that? He doesn't say just if the special few... Uh, just of the lucky ones, he says, If any man, any person, be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And what I like to point out about this is he didn't tell you to do it. He said the only if about it is if you're in Christ. And that just means that's Paul's language for being a Christian. If you are trusting in Jesus as your Savior, Paul calls that in Christ, meaning you're in a relationship with him. We could say it this way, by virtue of your relationship with Jesus, which on your part is through your faith in Him, by virtue, I could, I'm just going to say it that way. Therefore, by virtue of your relationship with Jesus, you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And just so you, you don't think 
that you have to accomplish this just so you don't get in your mind that, well, I better get busy and try to make this true. Look at what the next verse says. Torrin, if you could give me the next verse. And all things are of God. Now, what that means is everything we just got through talking about, God did it all. All those things I just mentioned, being a new creation, all things passing away, everything been made new, it's all God's work. That's what he's saying. All those things we just talked about are of God. Listen, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He's done the work. He came to us in a condition of condemnation, like we just read about, a condition uh, in which we just read, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. That's the condition we were in. He finds us in that condition, and he takes it upon himself to bring us back into harmony with him. You notice that God's the one acting. He has reconciled us to Himself by Jesus. And, look at this, He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That means that what the church is supposed to be telling people is, guess what? God has reconciled you to Himself. Now, what, what puzzles me is why, you know, if you just kind of take the words coming out of the church at large, why you hear every other message in the world other than this one. <laughs> You can hear anything, you can hear anything and everything other than, this is almost like secret information. I don't know why that, it shouldn't be. Paul said this is the ministry, that we're, the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of telling people that you're already reconciled to God. That's what this, the message here is. I don't know why, why anyone is uh, shy or afraid of this message. I think it's a good message. But let's go on reading. The message of, uh, the ministry of reconciliation. Okay. Now we can get to, uh, to the next verse, Torin. To wit. Now those words, to wit, not part of our vocabulary. I never say that. We don't go around saying it. That's legal language. That means specifically this is what I mean. You know, if you sign a contract, if you go down to the lawyer's office and sign some kind of a contract, it'll specify all the, you know, the details of what the contract's about. And then if it wants to tell you in more details, Specifically, what is being discussed, it'll say to wit. In other words, this is it. That's what it means. Here it is, or this is it. He just got through saying the ministry of reconciliation. So now to wit, this is it. You ready? The ministry that the church is supposed to be delivering, the message. This is it, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now when I read the word the world, you know what that makes me think? That makes me think of the world. <laughs> Everything in the world, everybody in the world. That makes me think of not just pick, pick, pick here and there, a lucky few, like God sitting up in heaven saying, let's see, that one right there, I'll take him, but the rest of them, no. No, it's not like that. The world means like he encompassed everybody everywhere and says, I'm going to reconcile everyone to myself. World is a universal word. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And by the way, are you part of the world? Yeah. You're included, aren't you? You and me. I'm included. You're included. Listen, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Trespasses means sins. You know what it means when it says not imputing? That means not charging with. Not charging your sins to you. Now see, this is so radical. You know what most people think God does every day? Most people think God's sitting up in heaven with a long white beard and a feather quill pen on a big high stool, and he's looking down, and he's saying, Ha, you thought you got by with it, but I saw you do that. I'm going to write that down. And you're going to get what's coming to you. No, 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 a thousand times no. Not only is he not doing that, but contrary, he's not imputing who's them, the world. He's not imputing our trespasses, not laying to our charge. You know why? Because he's already laid them to the charge of Jesus 2,000 years ago on the cross. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In other words, this is our message. Now, this is such a good verse, I want to read it to you in the Amplified Translation. If Torrin will give me that. Amplified... Uh, of course, a lot more words, but that's okay. They're good words. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world. That's universal. That includes you and me, doesn't it? I could put myself in there. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling me to himself. Not counting up and holding against men their trespasses. 
but canceling them. Not counting up and holding against you your sins and mistakes and trespasses, but canceling them. Canceling, that means blotting out, that means eliminating. And committed to us this message of reconciliation and the restoration to favor. Not if you'll do X, Y, Z, God will look favorably upon you. He's already restored you to favor with Himself. I think that's good news. Don't you think that's good? I, I really like that. But I, what I, the, the angle I'm working on right now is, did you notice it's everybody? Did you notice it's universal? Now, the good news about that is that includes you and me. That includes you and me no matter what, no matter anything else. There's one more I want to point out about this. Uh, Torrin, I'm going back to King James now. And this is a very familiar verse. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 16. But I want you to notice a particular word. John 3, 16, everybody knows how it goes. It's very familiar. It's okay. It's, it's good that it is. It's a good v verse to have. You know what, uh, what I think is if, if you didn't know any other theology than this verse right here, you'd have enough. This is enough right here. And everything else is just bonus, bonus material. For God so loved the world. Stop right there. Who's the world? Just a lucky few? No. Just certain righteous individuals? No. The world is a universal word, meaning everyone, and that includes you and me. You could put yourself in there. For God so loved me. Everything else uh, doesn't matter. Just you, as you are, who you are. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's talking about Jesus on the cross where He was uh, charged with our transgressions. That's why we're not charged with them. Now that is talking about what God did. That's a universal uh, benefit made available to everyone. But now we come to the final part of this. What's our part in this? Here's where it becomes specific. Now, what God does is universal. He doesn't have any favorites. He doesn't pick and choose. Sin is universal. God's salvation is universal. God doesn't pick. But guess what? Guess who chooses? We choose. The choice is not on God's part. The choice is on our part. It becomes specific when it comes to our response to God's grace. The next part of the verse says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And again, notice that he doesn't say whosoever measures up. See, we've already settled that question. There's none righteous, no, not one. By the way, when I read that before in Romans, that means Christians and non-Christians alike. Nobody is righteous. Christians are not righteous. You know, if you're a Christian, what that means is you've traded in your righteousness for somebody else's, for Jesus. You are made right with God by the righteousness of somebody else. You're still not righteous. It's not you, but you are the beneficiary of Jesus who is perfect, Jesus' righteousness. Now, notice that it doesn't require you to do anything. It doesn't require you to uh, uh, perform. It doesn't require you to uh, uh, have perfect performance or a perfect record or anything of the kind. It just says that whosoever believeth in Him. To believe in Him means to Trust in Him, to put your faith in Him, to place all your confidence in Him instead of in yourself. Now what our job in this is and what our part is and our response is to simply believe, to place our faith in Him, to place our trust and our confidence in Him. Now I want you to notice that this also is language that is used constantly in the New Testament to talk about the human response to this. And by the way, I base my explanation on what it means to believe in him on uh, the words of a, a Greek scholar, J.B. Phillips, who translated the New Testament into modern English in what's called the Phillips translation. And I found a very interesting book that he wrote after he translated the New Testament uh, about all the things he learned in the process of translating the New Testament into English. And he said one of the things that he found that he thought was interesting was when the Bible talks about believing, what it means to believe in Jesus, you know, in our English uh, uh, understanding of the word believe, it's just kind of a mentally agreeing with some proposition. In other words, I believe that the earth goes around the sun. I just believe that's a, you know, that's what we think believe means. Just some mental 
proposition and, and we agree with it. But in the Greek language, it implies uh, something of trust. More than just agreeing with a certain idea, it implies trust. So he says what the New Testament means when it says to believe in Jesus, it means you transfer your confidence from yourself to Christ. So that where God is concerned, I'm no longer trusting in myself, but I'm trusting in Christ. You see, that's a really important distinction. And I've talked to lots of people, Christians, churchgoers, people who've been in church all their life, according to what one person told me, who didn't seem to understand that. Um, you know, uh, I've told this before, but let me tell you again. So the reason I tell these stories is uh, to try to just illustrate the point. Uh, I, I got a call one time, and I do periodically get a call to come and visit with people or, or pray with people. Or, anyway, uh, uh, a particular couple who had come to the church a couple of times uh, called me and asked me to come and pray with their mother who uh, was ill and the doctor said she uh, won't, doesn't have long to live. And so uh, I didn't know this woman at all, never met her before, but I knew the couple who had visited the church a couple of times. This is way back when we first started, many moons ago. Uh, and so uh, I went to this house and uh, didn't know the woman at all. She went to another church and that's okay, it's fine. But um, so I said to her before I prayed, I said, are you a Christian? And I thought that would help me know how to pray. You know, because to me, you, 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 the response will either be yes or no, and that kind of informs how I'm going to pray with her. And I thought that's what she'd say. I, I said, are you a Christian? And I thought she'll either say, yes, I am, and I'll say, fine, you got nothing to worry about. I can just, you know, comfort her. And, uh, or she might say no, and then I know how to talk to her. But she didn't say yes or no. I said, are you a Christian? She said, I've been in church all my life. Well... That's, that's okay, you know, but that doesn't answer my question, does it? <laughs> you know, just like I've heard, uh, and I've said this, repeated it before too, sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, you can sit in the garage and it doesn't make you a car. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Sitting in church has got really nothing to do with it. You, and, and again, here we are in church. I'm not against being in church, but you know, you can be a Christian and not be in church. You can be a Christian and be in your home. What if you were on a desert island and there wasn't a church? You could be a Christian there too. What if you were on Mount Everest, there's not a church? Uh, you can be a Christian there too. The, having the church around is for your benefit, but it's, it doesn't determine who you are. She said, I've been in church all my life. Then she added this. She said, I just hope I've done enough good things so that I can make it in. Now, I knew what she was talking about. I know that's how people think. She said, the doc see, the doctor told her she doesn't have long to live, so she's worried now. And she says, what she thinks in her mind is that going to heaven when you die is all about uh, doing enough good things. Now, didn't we settle that, the very first verse I read this morning? Remember Romans chapter 3, verse, what was that, verse 10? Don't have to find it again, Torrent. Romans 3, I'll just quote it. There is none righteous, no, not one. Now, you know what that means? That means, on the, the negative side of it, no. And I didn't tell her this, but I could have said, no, you haven't done enough good things. <laughs> but no, no one else has either. You see, that's what that means. No one's done enough good things. That's what it means when it says there is none righteous, no, not one. Did I tell you? I think I did. When Paul, quoted, or Paul said that, as it is written, he's quoting from Psalms chapter 14. Uh, verse, uh, I wrote it down here, verse 3, if you want to read it later. You know what, hap what, what you find if you go back and read Psalm 14, verse 3, that Paul is quoting when he said, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. What it actually says in the psalm is, There is none that doeth good. So, where do we get this idea that uh, it's all about doing enough good things? Did, does it say that in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever doeth enough good things should not perish, but have ever Is that what it says? Why does everybody think that? Well, we'll not go down that path. It's because they hear the wrong thing. <laughs> We've heard the wrong things so much. And, you know, sometimes we just uh, assume some things. But here's what it does say. 
Not whoever doeth enough good things. Whosoever believeth in him. The things that you do are secondary and irrelevant. It's all about putting your trust in Jesus and not in yourself and not in your good things that you've done. You should never even consider that. Whosoever believeth in him means I'm no longer trusting in myself where God is concerned. Now I trust in Christ. He's the source of uh, all my righteousness. This is where it becomes specific. Uh, here's another one. And I just want to hit a couple more here just to highlight this and tie it all together. Galatians, Torn, Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. just want you to notice what this says. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. Haven't we read that before? All is universal, isn't it? Yeah. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them who do enough good things. No. <laughs> and again, I, I want to make this distinction because that is the distinction. That's what it means to believe. You don't trust anymore in the good things that you may or may not have done, but in Christ. The Scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Believe in Jesus. Put their faith in Jesus. Here's another one. Um, this is... Uh, I'm going to go back to Romans again, Torin. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. And we read some verses. I skipped around. Remember when I said I'm skipping around here? I want to read the surrounding verses just to tie it all together. But now the righteousness of God without the... Let's get the verse we read before. Go back to the uh, previous verse. Let's get verse 19. This is what we read before. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that every mouth might be stopped, and all the world might become guilty before God. Okay, let's get the next verse. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall, there be no, flesh, shall no flesh be justified in his sight. You know what that means? That means by doing enough good things, nobody is justified. That's what that means. By the deeds of the law. That means by, by performance, by actions, by the things that you do. Paul here plainly says that, that doesn't, that's not going to do it. Nobody, again... No flesh means nobody. Is that universal? Yeah. Again, it's kind of a, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to seem like I'm being negative here, but it's kind of disgraceful. How long has the church been around? Two thousand years, you know. Why are these opposite ideas so well entrenched, and these, these pure uh, uh, positive ideas almost like unknown? You know, talking about things like we're talking about today. It's so foreign to many people's religious understanding that it almost sounds like you're talking about something far-fetched or far out. Uh, but I'm, I, you know, I'm just reading here. Uh, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, next verse. But now, the righteousness of God, we could say being right with God, Without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Let's go and get the next one. Even the righteousness of God, which means being right with God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now again, the word of there means pertaining to. We could say faith in Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe. Now again, this is kind of half universal, half specific, but it means all you got to do is put your faith in Jesus. It doesn't, it, see, he's all them that believe. He doesn't say all them that believe and plus do everything right. No, all them that believe, everybody. All them that believe and upon all them, uh, the, uh, let's see, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Okay, next verse. This is one we read earlier. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's saying it doesn't make any difference. There's, all human difference is erased because everybody falls short. Therefore, the only thing that matters is that you put your faith in Jesus and trust in Him. Look at the next verse. Everybody knows this one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How about verse 24? This is really good. Now he's talking about the same people, all those that fell short. Being justified freely by His grace 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That means being brought into right standing with God freely. And uh, again, I don't want to labor over this too much, but the word freely, uh, do you know what free means? It means there's no charge. Now, if you ever go to the store and see something that says free, better pick one up. Because <laughs> that means there's no charge for it. Isn't that right? That means you don't have to exchange anything for it. You don't have to pay for it. Freely just means that we are made right with God at no charge. He doesn't expect anything in return through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, uh, yeah, I think I just want to stop there. That's good. Okay, we got the idea. So it's freely available to everyone, and that includes you and me. Let's all stand up today.